You're listening to the Sabina Road Baptist Sermon Series. We hope this message greatly impacts your life. For more information on the mission and ministries of Sabina Road Baptist Church in Tucson, Arizona, visit us online at sabinaroad.org. Joshua chapter 23 through 24. The title of today's message is Distinct Dedication. You know, when you are driving through big cities and we're driving to big cities, I remember if you were driving and uh, my, my buddy lived in, in Houston at the time and uh, for, for a long time there was, there was Houston and then there was this town and then there was this town and then, uh, but slowly but surely it's just become... Houston, and, uh, and there was a little town there, but they started blending and blurring together. Uh, right now, there is a difference between, sort of, between Casa Grande and Phoenix, but I'm not sure that that's going to last much longer. Before you know it, Casa Grande and Phoenix as a whole will have blended and blurred together. Now, that's not a problem in uh, regular life, but that is a problem blending and blurring of the Christian life. Uh, unfortunately, many believers look and act so much like the world that you kind of can't tell if you're with a lost person or a believer. When you're driving through the big cities and going through, uh, you can't tell, hey, if I, am, I, am I in this one or I'm in this old city? I'm, I'm not sure. And, 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 and many believers um, have adopted so many of the world's values, their actions, their behaviors, their attitude, it's hard to tell who's who. It's kind of blurry. You need a distinction. See, right and wrong are hard to see sometimes, and when it's hard to see, it's harder to choose. You do right. The people of faith choose the Lord over the world's love. Because these are longer chapters, we'll have to pick and choose a couple verses here. I encourage you to read 23 and 24 in your own time. But let's look with me in uh, verse 1 of chapter 23, and then we'll skip around here in this chapter 23. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, I'm skipping all the way down here to, to, to verse 5. The Lord, your God, will push them back. Talk about giving them land and taking care of them and, and, uh, and fighting with, for them. And, and so look with me in, in verse 5. The Lord, your God, will push them back for you and drive them out of your sight. You shall possess their land just as the Lord, your God, promised you. Therefore, be strong to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among them, or make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve by them, or bow down to them. Verse 8, But you shall cling to the Lord your God, just as you've done to this day. Skip all the way down to verse 14. Joshua said, and now I'm about to go, um, now, now I'm about to go to the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. And then, just so we have an idea of kind of what's happening in this passage. And so then he gives them a warning and then uh, about disobeying and breaking the covenant. And then in verse in chapter 24, he goes into the Lord's faithfulness, goes through Israel's history and how, uh, how, how good the Lord has been to the people of Israel. Well, let's well, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the ability opportunity to worship you through it. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would empower us, enliven, and 
enlighten our hearts and our minds. Lord, I pray that you help me to decrease, Lord, and for you to bend. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one is living with distinction. Living with distinction. See, Joshua was old and near death. And he gives one last speech to the people of Israel. As you know, Joshua has, has fought alongside the people of Israel under Moses' leadership and then under his own leadership. And, and God ha, ha, has blessed Joshua. And, and now Joshua, knowing that, that in his own heart, and his people's hearts, they have uh, uh, an ability to, uh, to, to, to wander and, and, and fade away from the Lord. So he's given them one last speech before he, as he says, goes the way of all the earth. In this last speech to Israel, we see a similar message and themes that Joshua has already been uh, sharing in this book that Israel has dealt with. Talk about remembering God's faithfulness. Well, that's something that's come up several times in this book. And we've talked about it and, and listened and, and, and worshipped. We talk about not mixing with surrounding countries. This is a familiar theme. Now, it's, it's important to understand that, that God's prohibition against the mixing with other culture had nothing to do with race and everything to do with religion. That they believed wrong, evil things. They did horrible, despicable practices. And God said, stay away from these people. Be distinct from these people. When I look at chapter 24, I have to be careful. I know we're kind of all, all around here. Of, of, of Chapter 24, verse 13. It says, I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities that you had not built. And you dwell in, you eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchard, orchids, orchards that you did not plant. God said, I gave you a fully furnished country. And, uh, and, and I expect you to use it for my glory. You ever feel that way? Sometimes I feel like God has just given me a fully furnished life. Uh, he, he gave the kids the personalities that, that, I, that they have. He made them beautiful. He, he gave me a, a wife. He gave me the blessings that he has put in my life. And so sometimes I just feel like, Lord, I'm just walking around in a fully furnished life that you've given me. That's exactly what he told Israel. He said, I gave it all to you. I gave you houses. I gave you vineyards. So remember who gave you these things. Once again, a, a common theme in the book of Joshua. But throughout Israel's history, they were uh, there was the continual weakness or the refusal to live separately from these evil cultures. God uh, put these prohibitions over and over again. And, and all throughout Israel history, you see them succumbing to this sin. You see them uh, betraying the commitments that they made to the Lord. And mixing with other countries and other cultures eventually brought them defeat and captivity more than once. Um, so they were defeated. And not only were they defeated, but they were brought as slaves into other countries. And God warned them and they did it even after they had already been in captivity. They made the same mistakes again. God told them, don't mix with this evil culture, it will pull your heart away from me. God knew that. See, Christians are faced with a similar challenge of mixing with our culture. Now, uh, some of these, the, the, the particular point of Pastor Stephen Cole, uh, I heard these from him, I thought these were fantastic, so I wanted to make sure I, I shared um, these points and gave him credit for it. But, but we have a, a similar problem, not uh, at nationally mixing with other cultures, but, but believers have different priorities than those of the world. See, worldliness is our biggest danger in this church. Once again, worldliness is the biggest danger this church will ever face. Not opposition from the outside, but worldliness compromise on the inside. Now, worldliness is not a term that is used much nowadays. Fifty years ago, you would have heard it a lot more, and a hundred years ago, you would have heard it even more. Worldliness. What is it? Well, it's not referring to the earth. 
because God made the earth, God made the world, and sometimes that word means that, and that's obviously not what it's talking about in some of the passages that we're going to look at. It's not talking about the people of the world. When God says that, that uh, for God so loved the world, it's not talking about it as in, in, in the context of these people. Well, let me give you a, a definition of worldliness. When the scripture talks about uh, don't be a part of the world, when we talk about when uh, Jesus... Uh, high priestly prayer in just a minute uh, this is the context it means by that it is the evil organized system under Satan which operates through unbelieving people who are opposed to God it is a value system one of the world's glory or God's glory Anybody who has walked with the Lord for any point of time, any period of time, has felt the world's pressure on them. You know, when you are going down to the depths of the ocean, you can only go so far uh, in your own human body. And even now, we're still limited by the submarines and apparatus that we can go. But the further you go down into the ocean, the greater the pressure is. And if you go down in your own body, the uh, ocean will literally flatten you. And it's an amazing thing how God made sea creatures that can go in and out all by itself. But we're not those creatures. We have to have a very expensive, very complicated uh, submarines that, that bring us down and keep that pressure from crushing us. But the further you go down, the more you feel that pressure. And the longer you spend time in this world, the more you feel that pressure from the world. To live right, to live a life that is pleasing to God is in direct opposition to an evil worldly system ran by Satan, uh, influenced by Satan, uh, with people who are opposed to God. So if you've got your Bibles, look with me in John chapter 17. I encourage you, if you don't bring your Bibles to church, bring your Bibles to church. And uh, if you have phone Bibles, hey, that works. But uh, look, along, look along with me in Joshua, sorry, John chapter 17, verses 13 through 19. And Jesus says this. This is his prayer for believe. He says, but now I'm coming to you. These things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has needed them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus said believers must maintain balance. Once again, God has a plan and a purpose for believers to be here in this corrupt world system. If he didn't, then all he'd have to do is zap us out of here the second that we became believers. But that's obviously not the plan of Jesus. That he wanted us to be in this world, but he did not want us to be of this world. He wanted us to be distinct from this evil world system. We are to maintain balance. And I just want to spend a couple moments here talking about what that balance looks like. Because it can be really tricky to find. Jesus wants us to be in the world. We are to be in the world. We are here. So don't isolate yourself. You don't see that in the life of Jesus. He wasn't just hanging around the good church folks of his time, was he? He was hanging around people who had some real difficulties, who were really struggling, who had really bad reputations, and yet Jesus loved them. He spent time with them, but Jesus was never influenced by them. Jesus was always influencing them. We have a responsibility as believers to be in this world. We can't just hunker down uh, behind our, our, our church walls and, 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 and keep ourselves uh, secluded and, uh, fr from the world. We'll, we'll never reach the world. We'll never be salt. We'll never be light if we are completely separate from them. 
That's not how Jesus did. See, Jesus always had a perfect understanding of His divine mission. That He came here to do exactly what the Father had told Him. That He could bring forth the process of redemption and salvation of humanity. And you and I have a divine mission. Now, we're not here to, to save souls. We can't do that. We have the divine mission of pointing people to our Savior. And so we must always have this divine mission in our mind. So when I meet friends, when I meet lost people, yes, I care about them. Yes, I, I love them. Yes, I, I want to be friends with them. But ultimately, what I want to do is push them to my good and gracious Savior. Always understanding what our mission is as believers. Jesus said, expect opposition. Jesus had to have a, a clear understanding of what's going to happen. Now, if you go out in the world, just what? I'm just going to tell him that Jesus, and he's good, and salvation, and, and it's going to free him from that. That's all good news. But man, I'm telling you, the lost world doesn't see it as good news. And so Jesus said, you will have opposition. They will hate you because they hated me. So understand that you will be rejected from the world at large. We have to be okay with that. We are to be in the world. But Jesus says we also are to be distinct from the world. An easy way or easier way to do that is understand where true joy comes from. That it comes from satisfaction of the soul by knowing God or who He really is, allowing His presence in your life and the longer that you know that the less inclined that you'll be to try to find love and, uh, and, and satisfaction and purpose and the ways that the world says so and so when you know who Jesus is when you know who God is when you know where true joy comes from you won't be as inclined to go seeking it in the wrong places are you with me so far church? you have to have a new nature if you're going to be in this world, but not of the world. Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, what now? <laughs> i got to be born again? I, I, Jesus, I'm going to become young again. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. You must be born again spiritually. You must have become a believer. You must be transformed. If you, if you don't have a new nature, you don't have a new nature that loves God, you will, you will automatically drift the things of the world. But when a believer has been changed, God doesn't just change on the, on the outside. He changes first and foremost on the inside. He changes our want to. So now I want to serve the things of God. It's impossible to convince a lost person to love God because in their heart they don't love God. They love the things of the world. They must be transformed. They must be born again. Only then can they love the things that God loves. Jesus said, sanctify them by the truth. Sanctify, set them apart by your word. Your word is truth. So we as believers, we must know God's word. And we must obey God's word. The world's full of lies and misconceptions and misunderstandings about what we should be and who we should be and what we should do and, and what we should worship. And so knowing God's word and obeying God's word is the only way to combat that. We are to be in the world. We are not to be of the world. We are to be distinct from the world. But we cannot set ourselves so far apart from the world that we have no light to give. You know, when you're young and you go swimming in the pool, uh, you don't, at least when I was little, man, I didn't never, you never closed your eyes. Man, you just were swimming all day long. And remember, I'd go to my aunt's pool and we would just, we would just swim for like, 48 hours straight. We take a little peanut butter and jelly break, and then we go right back into the pool, man. We just look, and, uh, and, and we our eyes, man, would just be red and blurry for like the next three days, and we would just be walking around, uh, trying and, and going to Sunday school, and it, and you just everything was blurry. We couldn't see anything um, because of the bad choices that we had made. You see, we are prone to sin when our hearts are blurred. We can't see things as they are. We make bad decisions. Satan is always Satan and his forces. The world system is always trying to realign what is right and what's wrong. There are some things our world can still uh, say that is wrong. And this is right. 
But all those margins are always widening. The gray area which used to be here is always getting wider. So we don't let the world set these standards. We let Christ and His Word set these standards in our hearts. And I encourage you, this young person, the world is always trying to blur the lines between what your purity should be, what was acceptable 15 years ago, uh, and what is acceptable now uh, are not the same things. Then you go back just 50 more years, and you go where the 60s, and then the, the 50s, and, and that line about what is acceptable for, for, for young people to be doing, for young uh, adults to be living by. I'm telling the world standards are completely different than God's, and that, that gray area is always widening. If you're a businessman, the, the, the world is always after your honesty. And so, so yeah, you, you know, you can say this, but it doesn't have to mean this. And you're never, you can't get ahead if you don't do these things. And so, so, so bend, bend the truth. Tell these lies. Puff yourself up. And, uh, and the world is going after your honesty. Parents, the Lord is always, the world is always going after your responsibility. Whose role it is to influence your children. What role you should play in their lives grown children or young children it makes no difference you have a role to play with them and god wants to to use you in that and the world says no no no, no. give it to the schools uh give it to somebody else you take what you take and, and you, you take what's good for you and, and don't don't worry about what what the what their responsibility is as parents but god says no no, no. it's your responsibility that you should be honest that you should be pure See, the more the influence of the, the, the world has influence over the church, the less influence the church has over the world. We have nothing to say to them. See, worldliness is not just setting arbitrary rules to feel better. And that's a lot of what happened in, in really the last hundred years. The church said, uh, movies are bad, bowling is bad, dancing is bad, all these things are bad. And, and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of bad things that have gone around in all of those things, especially my bowling score. I mean, it's always really bad, but, 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 but I understand that culture, those things were, were, they did have a lot of bad things going on at that time. But just, it's, it's not about blanket statements uh, about uh, just setting rules. That's not what God's saying. Worldliness is about competing loyalty. Who and what will you give your life to? Jesus says, give it to me. The world says, no, 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 give it to me. So as believers, we are to live with distinction. We are to be a different people, not an uppity people. A distinct, a different people than the world. We have different values, different actions. We speak differently. We talk differently. We live with distinction. Point number two is love with dedication. Look with me in verse 14 and we'll see uh, in verse 15 a verse that we all know very well. Chapter 24, verses 14 through 21. It says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Pray away, sorry, put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers serve in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whom land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who did these great things in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land, therefore we also will serve the Lord. He is our God. Verse 19. But Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. For if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then He will turn and do you harm and consume you. And after having done 
you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Skip down the, all the way to verse 26. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us. Who has heard all these words of the Lord that spoke that He spoke to us? Therefore, it shall be a witness against you, you, but if, unless you deal falsely with your God. So Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. Look at verse twenty-nine. After these things, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being one hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in his own inheritance at Timnath Sarah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gath. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work the Lord did for Israel. Love with dedication. See, Joshua challenges the people one last time to commit wholeheartedly to the Lord. Joshua shows no matter what the cost, he and his will serve the Lord. The people promise and he challenges them once again. He said, you need to serve the Lord. And they say, we will. And he said, nah, you're not going to do it. He says, God is, is, is served with, with justice and, and, uh, and, and he's holy and jealous and, 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 and you're not going to do it. And they say, we will, we will. He is warning them against cheap grace and superficial commitment. And then the book finishes with the recommitment of the people and the death and legacy of Joshua. The people have the same choice that we have. It has not changed all throughout the history of humanity and it never will. To love God or love the world. Their world was a lot different in our world, their temptations to some extent were different than ours. We always have the same choice. The choice. Serve the Lord or something else. Y'all remember the Bob Dylan song? That you're going to serve somebody. It might be the devil. It might be the Lord. Bob Dylan is a singer from you. There's some of you young people out there. Right? <laughs> it might be the devil. It might be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. I'm telling you, that is the truth. The option of not serving somebody is not on the table. You are going to serve the Lord, or you are going to serve something else. Psalm 84.10 says this, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. I've heard people ask me this question, how involved should we be in church? Simple answer to that is, how involved do you want God in your life? And I'm not being facetious, I'm not, being, I'm not exaggerating. Somebody says, how involved do we be in church? Like, how much do you want God to work in your life? How much do you want God to use you? If you want Him to use you greatly, then be greatly involved. If you're not that concerned, then don't be. Because there, that, that's what's on the table. If you want to serve God, then you must be part of His people. In 1889, there was a land rush in the Oklahoma Territory, and people would line up, and, and uh, land was given out for free, uh, which would be nice nowadays, but that's not the way it works. And, and uh, you had to be the person to get there sooner than the other people did. And some people cheated and went ahead and got there the night before. And, and, uh, uh, and, but, the, but the ones that did it right, they, they, they shot the gun out and the people ran and they had to stake a claim in their, on their land. And so they, they, they got there, they, they beat the other people there and they, they put their stake in the ground. They said, this is my land. I will not be moved. I cannot budge. This is mine. And as believers, we must do a similar thing with the Lord. That we say, God, this is, I am with you. You are my God. I cannot be budged. I cannot be moved. You are my God. I stake a claim on the promises that you have given me. I choose Jesus over the things of this world. 
drive that stake in the ground. Commit to be a part of this church faithfully. Commit today to serve somewhere. Commit to baptism if that's something that you need to do. And commit to the Lord if you've never had a time when you've turned from your sin and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. We each have different commitments to make, but we all must be committed to the Lord. Saying, I, I won't choose sports over you, God. I won't choose money. I won't choose career. I won't choose comfort. I choose God above all else. Fathers, fathers, fathers. You are the spiritual leaders in your home. When Joshua says, as for me, as for me, as the father of my house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He said, I don't care what you do. You will not influence me. What you do will not affect my obedience to the Lord. As for me and my house and everything that I have, we will serve the Lord. Amen. You have that responsibility, Father. You have that responsibility, eventual Father. Father of grown children, which I know is a lot of what our congregation is. You still have a responsibility to God and lead your children towards godliness. Yes, it's a different relationship, but we must carry the torch. This hymn you guys know really well. I'm just going to read it because... I'm not going to sing it. That's the other option. So I just, I, I just, I just want to read a couple. This is a, a verse, and it's just beautiful. Uh, it says, "Fair is the sunshine, fairer still the moonlight, and all the twinkling starry host. Jesus shines brighter. Jesus shines purer than all the angels in heaven can boast." Oh, friends, it's all about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. It was about Jesus and Joshua. It was about Jesus and John. And it's about Jesus now. I'll close with this story. Uh, a friend of mine who uh, became a believer later in life, he, was, uh, he lived a, a typical worldly lifestyle, uh, was, was uh, living in sin and uh, and, and a life that was against the things of God. And, and, and when he got saved, he got radically saved. And God pulled him from all of that stuff that he was involved in. And I remember sitting down with him in a library at school one day. And we were talking. And, 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 and I can't remember the context of it, honestly. If we were talking about temptation or, or what it was. But I, his response, I, I've never forgotten this uh, to this day. And he said, John, why would I ever go back? Why would I ever go back? Now, a person that got saved early and, and God, praise God, kept me from so many evil things that I'm sure I would have gotten involved in apart from God's saving hand. Uh, I, I, I can see the pool. I can see the allure of sin. And he experienced it. And he said, John, why would I ever go back? It was meaningless, unfulfilling, it brought shame and guilt. He said, why would I ever go back? And that's the question all believers must ask ourselves regularly, is do we really want to go back to the darkness that God has saved us from? People of faith, choose the Lord over the world's love. And as we move into the invitation time today, this is the challenge of God's Word. Depending on where you're at, you need to spend more time with the worldly people or less time with the worldly people. You say, Pastor, I, all my friends are Christian. I listen to Christian music. I read Christian books. And that's all I do. And hey, that's good. I'm glad that you're walking in purity. Praise God. But what influence are you having over a lost world? Are you being salt? Are you being light? You say, if, if you're doing a really good job of, of not being of the world, but you're not very doing a very good job being in the world, maybe start praying for God to bring people in your life 
most importantly, praying for ways that you can go where you can go, where you can go. Not people come, but where you can go and influence lost people. Now, people who are working all around lost people all the time, that's not hard to do. But sometimes that's hard for me as a pastor. I work with Tim. I work with Tammy. They're godly people. So I have to go. I have to, I have to go somewhere else. I gotta go to a restaurant. I've gotta volunteer somewhere. I've gotta join a club where lost people are at. We gotta go play T ball with lost parents. We have to do those things. So be praying about how you can influence a lost world. And maybe you're on the other end of that spectrum right now. And that's okay. You say, John, maybe I'm a newer believer, or I'm just struggling with, with planting that stake in the ground. I, I, I'm struggling with wanting the things of this world. And, and, I, and I need to be a little bit more uh, 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 in love with Jesus and not so much of the world. Help me, help me to, to, to get away from that. I need to spend a little bit more time with godly influences that are going to help me do right instead of do wrong. Do that today. Ask God to lead you the direction that you need to go. God wants you in this world. But God wants us to stand from this world. Commit your ways to the Lord. Commit your ways to Jesus. Commit your life to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. You love Jesus. Do you obey Jesus because you love Him? Do you come to church because you love Him? Do you serve God because you love Him? So I, I, want, I want to drive that stake in the ground today and commit my ways to the Lord. Let's pray. Well, thank you for today. Well, thank you for your faithfulness. Well, I, I thank you for the privilege of serving in the world. Sometimes it can be frustrating. Sometimes it can be challenging. Lord, help us to, to be faithful as you were faithful. Lord, help us to love people who are hurting and direct them to a Savior that loves them and cares about them. Lord, keep us from the temptations that we struggle with. Lord, mixing with world, embracing the world's philosophies and the world's values, the world's speech and actions. Lord, keep us distinct people. Help us to commit to purity and distinction today. And Lord, I pray for those who maybe don't know you. They never had a time in their life and they've turned from their sins. They've trusted Christ as their Savior. I pray that today that they would give their life to you. They would come forward. We stand and sing and say, I've given my life over to Jesus. I want to give my life over to Jesus. We love you. And I ask and say in Jesus' name.